Incredibly, it has already been two years since we started camping in a very small camper van. It seems just like yesterday that I was building the kitchen boxes. We've been camping in campgrounds, in national parks, and on the road in the summers. And over those two years, I've had a chance to see all the parts of the van build in action, in all different settings. I found that there are some parts of the van I love, and there are other parts just screaming to be changed. Everyone has been so supportive and appreciative in the comment section that I feel kind of bad picking things apart like this. But in the long run, it will make for a better minivan camper build. I thought I would take a look at the kitchen setup first, because there are a few things in there that I feel I need to change. So it is a good time to visit the kitchen and see what works and what doesn't. First of all, here's the kitchen as you would have seen it in my recent van tour video. But this is the kitchen as it was when I made the kitchen boxes video. So a few things are different. This is the first version of the garbage compartment, and this is the version we have now. This is the drawer for jars and spices and stuff, as originally planned, and this is the one I have now. Now the reason for these changes is simply that I messed up when planning the kitchen. I put the blame on trying to build a kitchen for a small, awkwardly shaped space and trying to keep a lot of different things in mind while working and a few of those things got forgotten. But in the end, the truth is that I made a mistake and the kitchen didn't fit in the van. One factor is the shape of the opening in the back, which narrows towards the top, which I didn't keep in mind when planning the boxes. I based all my careful plans on the measurement at the widest point, but that is not the same as up at the level at the top of the boxes. Another problem was that I didn't really have the option to go back and forth to the van while building. So I didn't catch my error until it was all done and I went out to install it and the boxes didn't fit. So what to do? The problem areas were the pantry box, which could not open because of the way the opening narrows. The whole thing was just too wide, so one of the sections will have to go. The only part of the kitchen that could easily be changed was the garbage compartment. So that is the one that had to go. And the cooler on the other side can't open either. To solve the pantry box's problem, I moved it to the middle of the shelf. I took the garbage compartment back to the workshop and cut the whole thing off on the table saw. I couldn't move the cooler much because of the vents on the right hand side, but I could scooch it over a bit. This will also leave more room for air to circulate around the vents. So back in the woodshop, I built new boxes for the garbage compartment and the condiments drawer and attached them to what was left of the water box. The new garbage section is made to hold a plastic bag and was shaped to use the space available in the curve of the lift gate opening. This is actually the second version of the second garbage box. In the first version, the whole thing was one piece, but I redid it so as to have the garbage compartment separate to make emptying it easier. So all was good now. Sadly, no, because even after all that, there is still the problem that the darn thing is just way too small. Even on a weekend camping trip, it fills up quickly and things have to be strategically stacked here and there. The setup also makes any kind of sorting impossible. Ideally, we would need four sections, one each for compost, recycling and garbage, and a space for empty butane cans. There just isn't anywhere to move the garbage to, so this will need a complete rethink. In the end though, the narrower drawer I had to make is much better for things like oil and honey and stuff, since they can't tip over in the narrow drawer. The water box is problematic all around. The first issue is that I made these cute little holes to allow me to see the water level, but once it is in the closed box, it is much too dark to see anything inside. To try to fix that, I decided to put a light inside the box. I lined the back of the box with metallic foil tape. I added a switch, I cut small pieces of LED light strips to fit where the bottom of the water jug was recessed and soldered the connections. I encased the whole thing in clear resin to make it completely waterproof. I installed it in the back of the box and wired it up to its switch. And it was too bright. And that made it hard to see the water level for a whole different reason. 
In the end, I stuck foil tape over the main strip of lights, and that brought down the brightness enough to get a better contrast between the empty and the full parts of the water jug. But my problems with the water jug were just starting. Its tap is made with a very low profile to allow it to be turned around and stored inside the opening of the jug, but the result is that it is just crazy hard to grip. It wasn't so bad at first, but it really got on nerves after a while. The tap also needs to be fully closed, or it leaks a bit, which also makes it harder to open. So I tried making a bigger handle for the tap with a wider surface to get a bit of grip on, but there just isn't enough tap handle to attach it to, so it's back to the drawing board for that too. But wait, there's still more problems with the water jug. The way it is designed has the opening at the bottom of the jug, and over time we started noticing more and more leaks. I kept finding the wooden compartment full of water. That has lifted the acrylic varnish inside, and the leaks have also damaged the finish on the shelf below it, and even under the box as water tends to run under there. But there's no point blaming a $20 plastic water jug. The problem is a mistake on my part, designing a complicated labor-intensive kitchen build around cheap components, and a mistake I made more than once. I still like the pull-out sink though, Though it would have been good if it was under the spout at all times. That would have helped with the leaking, I guess. The cutlery drawer is really small, but magically everything somehow fits in it. Knives and forks and spoons, but also spatulas and big serving spoons. The pantry box is pretty straightforward. It's just the right size for keeping the foods that don't need to go in the cooler. But I didn't leave any space between the boxes, so the lids rub against each other when you open and close them. Not a big deal, but it could be better. The stove compartment is good. It took a lot of figuring to get the hinged front to line up prettily on the outside. Each box has handholds on the sides. This makes putting everything into the van much easier. On the other hand, I also have a few obsolete holes in the boxes. This one was for hooking up the propane tank. My old stove ran on propane, so I just assumed I would use propane with the new stove. And I even chose this particular model because it could use both fuels. The box was designed so that the stove could stay hooked up even when it was stored. The hoses all fit behind the drawer in the garbage bin, and I could reach in through the garbage compartment to turn the gas on or off. It took me a while to find the right parts for this, since the hose that came with the stove was very short and it had a regulator, but no shutoff valve. This torch extension hose has the right fittings and a shutoff valve. But in the end, the butane canisters were so much easier to use that we have rarely hooked up the propane. I do keep a propane cylinder and the original hose handy for those very cold mornings when the butane does not want to burn. I bought a windscreen at the same time as a stove, which is very helpful when cooking outside. The little stove itself is great. I don't miss having two burners at all, and I appreciate how much smaller it is. I made one improvement, which was to add a couple of half-inch rare earth magnets under the stove top, which is just enough to keep the top in place when handling the stove. I can either use the stove on the pull-out kitchen shelf, or bring it to the picnic table if we want. And the cooler, the cooler. I tried my best, and I defended my choices to those who tried to warn me, but now I have to admit that it was a complete fail. I was quickly made aware that thermoelectric coolers have some downsides. They can only cool 20 degrees Celsius below the ambient temperature. That means that if it's 35 degrees out, the inside of the cooler will be 15 degrees at best. That's about 60 degrees Fahrenheit, which is not great for inside a cooler. And the opposite is also true. If it gets down to 10 degrees, the cooler can freeze everything inside. I tried to overcome these problems by adding a thermostat to stop it from getting too cold, and extra insulation to help keep it cool. But last year, after I installed the battery monitor, it became glaringly obvious that the cooler drew way too much power for my 100 watt panel, 90 amp hour battery setup. To compensate for its lack of cooling power, I've taken to using ice in the cooler, which is kinda ridiculous. I keep the ice in a 20 pound dry bag, so the melt water can't get into the electrical parts. This bag is big enough for a full size bag of ice, either in cubes or a block. The bag keeps all the water in and it's easy to drain. 
I'm very proud of this filler piece that hides the edges of the styrofoam insulation, since it had to be cut in one piece just the right size. The marks on it are from the metal foil tape rubbing on the wood. I would be sorry to get rid of the cooler just because of that filler piece. I was very proud of all the improvements I made on the cooler. But it comes back to that same design mistake. I did all that work on a cheap cooler instead of waiting and getting a proper fridge. You can get a good look here at the construction of the boxes. They are all 3 8 of an inch Baltic birch plywood put together with simple butt joints that are glued, pinned, and clamped and left to dry overnight. The cooler lid uses the cooler's own hinges to open and close the wood casing. And you can see the screws I added to keep the wood lid in place and the way I cut back the edge to allow the lid to fully open. Though ironically, I can't open it all the way because the edge of the van is in the way. The problem is that to get all the kitchen boxes to fit, I had to place the cooler as far over as I could while still being able to close the lift gate. So do I spend money adding more solar and another battery, or do I change the cooler? A second battery would be another 60 to 70 pounds of weight. And in the end, a cooler that can't cool more than 20 degrees below ambient is just not worth it. The main work surface of this kitchen is the pull-out shelf. It's just a sheet of half-inch birch plywood that slides between two other pieces. But getting everything I wanted to fit into a minivan meant juggling a lot of different constraints. And in trying to keep the height of the boxes below the back window, I wound up lowering the height of the kitchen shelf. So now the shelf is a bit too low to work on comfortably. Something I was very careful to plan for in the prototype version, but somehow forgot for this version. But I did keep that back window clear. This allows me to have a clear view of the road behind me at all times when driving. But given everything else, the kitchen boxes could have been a couple of inches higher without blocking much of the view at the back, which would have been enough to keep the kitchen shelf at the right height. Another thing I like is that by keeping all the boxes at the same height, I can use the tops as more counter space when cooking, and even as a bedside table from the bedroom side. Which reminds me of another design point. Stuff gets dirty when camping like these pale colored tea towels. So you might as well design your van with that in mind. One of the things I love to do when camping is to cook over an open fire. But no matter how careful I try to be, I get soot on my hands and then onto everything else. So it becomes a question of designing for that. I came across these black tea towels, which are perfect, since they don't show the smudges the way most tea towels would. And for the same reason, I should not have gone for such a pale blonde wood finish since it shows the dirt so easily compared to a darker wood stain. The drawers are good, but they could be a bit deeper, which they would have been if the shelf was higher. One drawer is pretty organized, but the other is like a giant junk drawer. I might try dividers in this one to keep it organized. So over the years, the kitchen has evolved, starting with this first mock-up made of scrap wood and whatever else was around, to the prototype version, which had shelves and drawers made more or less to size for the components, and plastic bins for the storage drawers. This latest kitchen has worked pretty well, whether camping in the middle of nowhere or in campgrounds, cooking whatever we like with everything close to hand. Sometimes I wish the kitchen in my house was so well organized. But as this walkthrough has shown, there are a few problems that can't just be sawed off and rebuilt. Part of the problem was a cheapskate attitude which led me to use inexpensive components, like the cooler, like the water jug, combined with wanting to fit as much into a small space as possible. The result is that each component's box is made to measure with no slack, so it is impossible to just switch out the cooler for a 12-volt compressor fridge, because it would be impossible to find one with the same dimensions and it has become clear that I can't trust that water jug and that the battery can't handle the cooler, so something will have to change. Which is good, because as much as I like traveling and camping, I like designing and building even more. So it looks like there will be a new, new kitchen in this very small camper van's future. Thanks for watching. Happy camping.